Welcome back, Dram Fam, to the official episode one of the Whiskey Bible. Is there a proper way to taste whiskey? And can I give you any tips to taste whiskey better? Let me explain. In this video, I'm gonna try and give you five ways to get the most out of tasting whiskey and an obligatory bonus tip at the end. There is fundamentally no right or wrong way to taste whiskey. At the end of the day, you've spent your entire life eating and drinking and experiencing tastes and smells and whatever else. You know how to taste. It's something that you know how to do already. I think the biggest issue that people have when tasting whiskey is knowing how to articulate what it is that they're actually tasting and experiencing and putting that into a word that you can describe or write down and explain to someone else. If you leave high percentage alcohol in a barrel for a long period of time, uh, years, a lot of weird shit can happen to it. And whiskey tasting is about exploring the spirit that's come out the barrel and articulating the flavors and finding out what you do and do not enjoy so it can better inform your decisions later on when you go to buy whiskey. So let's get down to it. My first tip is using the correct glassware. Now you can see I've got a number of glasses next to me and they're all fine for tasting whiskey, but some are definitely gonna give you an advantage when it comes to identifying and getting the most out of the spirit that's in the glass. The most common one you'll see is the rocks glass or the tumbler. And while there's absolutely nothing wrong with this, it's definitely not gonna funnel the majority of the esters and the alcohol from the glass up into your nose. Now, what we have here is a Glencairn. This is what you'll commonly see described as a nosing glass or a tasting glass. And the idea of this glass is that because it has a wide bell at the bottom, it gives a much greater surface area for the top of the whiskey to breathe and release all of its odors and its esters and its vapors. And then as the top narrows, the idea being it funnels those smells up into your nose and concentrates them. So you stand a chance of getting a more accurate depiction of what's in the bottom of the glass, as you can see here. They do come in various shapes and sizes and they're no different, just a bit smaller so you have less surface area around the top for the whiskey to expel its vapours. And finally, if you really want to go the whole hog, we have the 1920s blenders glass. Again, much like the Glencairn glass as before, we have the wide bell at the bottom for the maximum surface area and a really, really narrow top to really funnel the vapours right into your nose. A glass like this really does maximise that surface area to funnelling effect of all of the glasses that we've got here. I've drunk some whiskies that I'm very familiar with out of a 1920s blenders glass and it's not so much that they smell completely different but there's definitely been notes that I can pick up from this which I've definitely struggled out of some of the other Glencairns and such. There is nothing wrong with any of the glasses I've got here. All of them are just fine, and at the end of the day, what you've got is better than nothing at all. But there are definitely glasses which are gonna give you an advantage over others. So let's say you've selected your glass. In this case, the Glencairn. The next tip I have is to use the right amount of whiskey in the glass. You want to get it up to the widest point of the glass. Not too much, not too little. That way you're gonna maximize the surface area across the top of the whiskey, which is gonna allow the most amount of vapor to be expelled for you to smell. The third tip I have for you is air, breathing, and circulation. You don't want to overcrowd your senses. By just sticking your nose straight in the glass, you're just gonna get a big hit of alcohol and you could say singe your senses or burn your senses and you won't be able to detect any of the nuance in the glass. Quite often it pays to smell. Smell again, always keeping a bit of a gap between your nose and the top of the glass. And the more times you dip back into the glass, you can build it up and get stronger until you kind of find a point where you're not really detecting anything new in the whiskey. Some people 
I like to swirl the whiskey to expel more vapors. Again, maximizing that surface area of the whiskey around the glass. Some people claim to put their hand on and give it a shake. That's not really something I subscribe to personally, but again, it's whatever works for you. There's objectively no right or wrong way to do it. This is the part of the tasting where you're going to try and describe the nose of the whiskey, which are the smells and what you get from the vapors alone. What one person experiences can be completely different to another. What I might perceive as woody, you might perceive as leathery. And again, that's okay. During its time in the barrel, whiskey can pick up all manner of different smells. They can be described as, and I have to refer to my notes here, oaky, piney, woody, citrus, spicy, herbal, smoky, barbecue, peaty, medicinal or band-aidy, sometimes described as phenolic, vegetal, grassy, or even alcoholic, at the end of the day, it's a big glass of 40 plus percent alcohol. And what I might perceive as musty, you might perceive as woody. A smell is gonna remind you of something and you're trying to describe the memory and put a word to it. So it's entirely subjective between everyone. Now it's time to taste the whiskey, which brings me on to tip number four. Sip, breathe and go. Don't think too much about what it is you're tasting. Don't look too deep for all kinds of things that might not be there. Just sip and what's the first thing that comes to your mind? This is what's often called the palate of the whiskey. It quite often helps me to keep a pen and paper next to me. So when I'm tasting, I can write things down as they come to me. And later on, I can kind of identify things that I might initially say as barbecue, as smoky or sweet. You might not initially even be able to put your finger on exactly what it is that you're detecting. It might just be a memory and you write that down and later on you can try and break that apart and get its individual components. Um, there's a whiskey I've got here, I can't remember which one it was, but I initially described it as Pop-Tarts on fire. So I got that sweet cereal flavor along with like a, a fruit jam and a lot of smoke. So to me at that time, it instantly reminded me of burnt Pop-Tarts and later on I broke that down. It's at this point as well, we can start describing the texture of the whiskey. Is it thin or is it uh, oily and clingy? Does it have a burning sensation or is it quite drying and salty? All of these things are a product of its time spent in the barrel and can vary wildly from whiskey to whiskey. Now that we've swallowed the whiskey, we can go on to talk about what's known as the finish, which is what flavors does it leave behind? A phenomenon known as retronasal olfaction which is the way that we taste things sort of the other way around as they come back up through our nose as we breathe them out. We can also describe the length of the finish. Does it disappear quite quickly, or which we would call a short finish, or does it hang on for a long time and evolve and sort of a sweetness turn into a spiciness or vice versa? It's always worth going back for a second sip. Sometimes we need to get used to the alcohol or get used to the taste, and the second sip can reveal more things which we weren't able to taste before because it may have been masked by the alcohol. Which brings me on to tip number five, adding water. Now, this will always be a point of contention between whiskey enthusiasts. Some people will always add water, others never. I personally very rarely add water to whiskey, but I do find different whiskies respond differently. The Ardbeg 10, for instance, I find becomes less sweet and more grassy with just a few drops of water. Uh, this can vary as well. Some people throw only a couple of drips. For some people, it's a good splash. I'd never recommend adding water to a whiskey first. Always taste it first, see how it responds. Then when you go back later, you can add a small splash and you know we describe it as the whiskey opens up. And again, some respond differently to others. You may prefer some with or without. In my case, I prefer the Ardbeg 10 with just a couple of drips in a dram. And lastly, for my extra special bonus tip, is share your notes. It seems obvious, but a lot of the time, sharing your notes with others can help you put your finger on something which you maybe didn't identify before, or a flavor that you couldn't quite put your finger on. Guided tastings are always a great opportunity to share with others what you're experiencing and Quite often uh, you can be guided by someone who knows a whiskey very well 
I might be able to help you identify certain flavours in it, especially if it's a whiskey from a region that you're not too familiar with. Speaking of regions, in the next episode, we're going to be discussing the different regions of Scotland and what you can expect from the whiskies from each region. So uh, make sure you hit subscribe down below and click the bell icon to be notified when that's uploaded. As I said before, there is no right and wrong way to taste whiskey. Uh, the most important thing is you enjoy it and the more you do it the better at it you'll get if you like this video and if you learned anything from it drop a like down below and leave a comment telling me your best whiskey tasting tips that's all from me slangevar